So today we're going to learn a little bit about Iranian Jewish languages. Jewish Iranian languages have so much less data about them. There's so much less that we know about them, and it's a much newer field of study. And so we're going to go into it a little bit, and uh, yeah, we'll get started. Um, Iranian Jewish languages are many languages, and so we'll talk about a bunch of them. First, an overview. So where is Iran? Iran is also known as Persia, and that's the orange, uh, the orange bit right there in the middle right of this map. Um, Iran is a big country. It's only a few countries over from Israel. And so that's kind of, you know, people ask, how did Jews get to Iran? One reason is just, it's pretty close. It's, it's geographically right there. Um, other reasons are Babylonian and Assyrian conquest. The Persian empire was really big throughout history. So Jews have been living in Iran for around 2,700 years. So it is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, diaspora community of Jews. Now, when we talk about Iranian Jewish languages, that can mean two different things. That can mean languages of the Jews that, uh, that are spoken within the borders of the modern day nation of Iran. So that's one sense of it. So any language spoken in those borders can also be used to describe languages that are descended from that region. And so that would then include also uh, that brown region to the northeast of Iran, which would be Bukhari, and the Judeo-Tat language, or Juhuri, which is to the northwest in that gray region. Um, those are both Iranian Jewish languages also, in a sense. So we're going to focus a little more on the languages within the borders of modern Iran. So some nomenclature. What are these languages even called in the first place? So a major distinction that we can make, uh, that we make now, are... Um, the difference between Judeo-Persian and Judeo-Median languages. So Judeo-Persian is a term, and these are both Judeo-Iranian. So th these terms might get a little confusing, but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Judeo-Persian is used to describe two different things. It's typically used to describe the written language of Iranian Jews. So Iranian Jews have been writing in a dialect of Persian. Typically, it's basically classical Persian. But they've been writing in a version of that using Hebrew letters, but the Persian language for over a thousand years. And so Judeo-Persian is usually used to describe this written language, not necessarily a spoken language. However, it's also used to describe modern dialects of the Persian language, which is the major language of all of Iran and Afghanistan, Tajikistan, parts of Uzbekistan. It's a major language Persian. So Judeo-Persian is also used to describe Jewish dialects of that language that are more modern, that are influenced by some of the other languages we're going to talk about. Judeo-Persian is a Southwest Iranian language. So if we look at this, this fam language family on the top right of the page, you see there's the Indo-European family. That's many of the languages of Eurasia, from Spanish and English all the way to Hindi. So after Indo-European, you get the Indo-Iranian branch, that's Persian and Hindi, and a lot of those languages, then you get the Iranian branch, and then you get the split between Southwestern and Northwestern Iranian. Judeo-Persian, all Persian languages, Persian is a Southwestern Iranian language. And Judeo-Median, which is the other group we're gonna majorly talk about, is a Northwest Iranian set of languages. These are often preserved by Jews in the Central Plateau. So if we wanna look at it on this map, the blue dots are some dialects of Judeo-Persian, that are spoken. Um, it, it's very widespread. As you can see, it's kind of the language of the whole area. These red dots are Judeo-Median languages. They're much more confined to central Iran. The people who spoke them also spoke Persian, as that was a major language of the whole region. But they had their own Median languages, which are part of a different branch of this family. We'll get into it a little more. So. One thing is that if I were to go up to a speaker of one of these languages and ask them if they speak Judeo-Median, they would have no idea what I'm talking about. That's a term that is used by a few academics nowadays to describe these languages. The people who speak them call them different things. So Judeo-Persian dialects, the speakers call them Farsi. It just means Persian. Or Bukhari, which is the version of that in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Some people call them Judi. Some people call them Sarachali. Sarachali is the Tehran dialect of Judeo-Persian. 
which we'll talk about in this lecture. Other Southwest Iranian languages like Judeo-Shirazi, Shirazi is also a Southwest language. People call them things like Farsi or GD, or in the case of the languages of the mountain Jews in Azerbaijan, which are up, way, way up North, they call them, they call it Juhuri. It's way up North, even though it's a Southwest Iranian language. As for the Judeo-Median languages, they're called things like GD or Mahali, or in the case of Judeo-Hamadani, it's called Ebri, which means Hebrew. Um, even though it's not a Hebrew, it's not Hebrew, that's what they would call it themselves. So it asked, do you speak Hebrew? And they would say, yes, meaning I speak Judeo-Hamadani. They call it things like Kashi or Bugerdi. These are just like the names of the cities that these are spoken. So the point is that these languages, uh, they have their academic names, and then they also have the names that the speakers actually call them. So what is their language family? Let's get into that a little deeper. So we know there's a split between Northwestern Iranian languages and Southwestern Iranian languages. At least that's the, the origin. They aren't necessarily spoken in those exact regions anymore. So here are the languages, the non-Jewish languages of Persia. So we can see like the general context in which these Jewish languages exist. So you can see that Persian is the major region, spoken language of this whole region, right? Persian, a green one. Um, Persian is a Southwest language. It developed down here. If you can see my mouse down here in Pars. So that's where, uh, that's where Persian developed before spreading throughout the whole region. It was a major language of all of the Persian empires. So that's how that spread all over the place. The Median languages or the Northwestern languages developed up here in the Northwest of Iran. And you can see that there are still remnants of those. So Kurdish is a Northwest language. Gilaki and Mazandarani, right there by the Caspian Sea, those are Northwestern languages. And ironically, Baluchi, which is down in the far southeast of Iran, that red area, that is also a Northwest language. So it's just a big spread of these languages. They used to be much more widespread until Persian really took over the whole region. And we see this in the Jewish languages as well. The, the, the Northwest languages, the Median languages, are contained within one region, but the Persian languages are spread out throughout the whole region. So as I said, the blue ones, the blue dots, those are Persian dialects of Jewish Persian dialects. The red dots are Jewish Median, Judeo-Median dialects. And the yellow dots are actually Aramaic dialects, but they can also be considered in a sense, Jewish Iranian languages because they're spoken by Jews within the borders of modern day Iran, even though that's more of the Kurdish region. Um, so for example, my grandfather was from that region and he spoke Aramaic. I speak his dialect of Aramaic, but the rest of my grandparents were from central Iran and places like that. And they spoke Judeo-Median languages and Judeo-Persian languages. So many, many languages in this whole region of Jews. Um, so we got a lot to, to talk about today. This graphic is just another way to think about um, the language families of these of these languages. So if we go on the very left of that uh, of that graph, you see modern Persian. That's the modern Persian language that any Persian non-Jew would also speak. And there are Jewish dialects of that that are a little bit more, you know, have a little more uh, Hebrew vocabulary in them. But generally, they are, that is where modern Persian is. And now on this graph, the further back we go on it, you can see how far back these languages split off from Persian. Um, not that they split it, like they all split off and continue to develop next to each other in parallel. So it's not like one language split off and then remain there forever. So the closest language that we have to modern Persian would probably be what's called Tajik or the Bukhari language for the Jews. Um, this can still be called Persian in a sense. It's still intelligible with Persian. As a Persian speaker, I can completely understand Tajik or Bukhari. Then you get a little further back an older split, you get Judeo-Tat or Juhuri, that's the language of the mountain Jews. That's harder for me to understand as a Persian speaker. Then even further back is Judeo-Shirazi, still a Southwestern language, but quite different from Persian. And then way back before that, you get the split between the Southwest and Northwest languages, and you get all these Judeo-Median languages we're going to talk about. So it's a really interesting thing is that the language of Esfahan, which is right there in central Iran, the Jewish language of Esfahan is 
less similar to Persian than the Jewish language of Tajikistan, which is two countries away. So very interesting little thing that happens. And then a final thing that we'll also talk about is Lutera'in, which is a cryptic Jewish secret language that was used in nearly every town of Jews. Um, there's a lot, it's a whole other language. It has, we'll talk about it a little bit. The point is, there's a lot going on linguistically within Iran, even just among Jewish communities. And that's only what we know of, basically. I mean, every town in Iran had Jews at some point, so there were probably many more Jewish languages than the ones we even know about. So let's get into some of these regional dialects. Let's, let's uh, learn a little bit about these languages. Dialects of Iranian Jewish languages, we can see these are a bunch of different dialects that we know about. There are many more that we don't know about, or were historically. So there's Judeo Hamadani, Judeo Turisarkani, Judeo Borujardi, Nahavandi, Gopaigani, Khansari, Kashani, Esfahani, Yazdi, Kamani. These are all different languages. They're not necessarily intelligible with each other. Um, pretty, pretty wild what a what a diversity of languages there are. And then among the southwestern languages, there's Shirazi, there's Judeo Tat, which is that Azerbaijan language, and then there are various dialects of Judeo Persian, including Sarachaldi, which is that Tehran dialect. So first, just to get a sense of the sound of it, um, I know we have some Persian speakers here uh, here today. So if you're a Persian speaker, see if you can understand any of uh, what this man says in Judeo Kashani. And if not, just try to get a sense of what it sounds like, what the language sounds like. So we're going to listen to a little bit of this. <laughs> It has show very shish, very it has show very shish beshwa. Amulla, mona adema, shema khiyale kiri ke ada, khode baade hawa sire gado, mulla jawish jawish dado ke mo khase bhi nikaram, ta zumba pira khora ka. Okay, so I, I played this video for my parents last night, and as Persian speakers, they couldn't really understand what he was saying. Um, it's quite different from Persian. Okay, now we're going to look at another example. This is from Judeo Esfahani. Uh, Esfahan and, and Kashan are in the same province. They're very, very close to each other, like probably less than 100 miles from each other. Um, and their languages are not really intelligible to each other. They probably wouldn't understand each other, which is pretty wild. So this one I also played for my parents. They couldn't really understand it. They were remembering that some of their friends as kids had parents who talked like this, but as Persian speakers, again, this is not really intelligible. <laughs> Right, <laughs> Again, a, a, a very interesting dialect um, and not so easy to understand if you're a Persian speaker. Now, here's one in Judeo Shirazi. So, that's this should be closer to Persian because it's a Southwest language like Persian. So, any Persian speakers here, maybe it might be e easier to understand this one. Um, and this is a song in Judeo Shirazi. So, just so we can get a little bit of music also, uh, we're going to listen to a little bit of this. And if you're not a Persian speaker, just again try to get a sense of what it sounds like. <laughs> Um, 
All right, so this one I played for my parents and they could kind of understand. It was a little easier than Esfahani and Kashi. Okay. Now, let's talk about Judeo-Persian a little bit. So Judeo-Persian, there are, as I mentioned, there's the literary Judeo-Persian and there's the spoken one. These are two different things. So just to show kind of how different they might be, um, there's this, this is just a couplet from a, a manuscript that I found that so it says in English would be look in the era of every shock that ever was how the Israelites suffered. I want to depict a joyful time. Listen up and I'll tell you a story. So the way you would say that in literary Persian versus in colloquial Sanachali Persian of Tehran. Um, if you just read these two, they, they are quite different. So in literary, it would be now, that's Judeo-Persian. That's the written Persian language. This would be written in Hebrew letters. I just transliterated it into English. And then the colloquial version is so the way that people would actually say something like this in uh, in Tehran in the 18 and 1900s might be something like this. And this is a strange thing. I just did this myself, this translation. It's strange because it's a poem and colloquial Sanachali Judeo-Persian would never really be used for a poem. But if we were to use it just to see how different it is from the other one, it would be like this. Bechel, tu vechta har shahi kebud, che belayi bedjune Yisraela avordan. Mikham ya vechta khubo neshun bedan, so that's more like how my grandmother would speak. The literary one is the way that people would perform poetry. So some of these distinctive features of these languages. Let's, let's really get into it now. So the Judeo-Median languages have several things that uh, kind of do unite them in a way. So we have one is phonological changes. So we have the sound on in Persian would be on and in Judeo-Median and also in dialects of Judeo-Persian just because they've been influenced by Judeo-Median, they would say un. So for example, the city of Esfahan, famous city, Esfahan, in their own language would be Sfon. Kashan would be Kashun. Hamadan would be Hamadun. Tehran would be Tehran. It's not just cities, any, a lot of words that have that on and with un. So non, non means bread. Colloquially, it would be nun. Another one is that in Judeo-Median languages, and this one doesn't come into Persian, so Judeo-Median languages have what in Persian is a Z sound expressed as a J sound. And this comes from a common origin. So the word for woman, zan, in Judeo-Median would be jam. The word for life in Judeo-Median, instead of zendegi, would be jendegi. The word for day, which is ruz in Persian, would be rej or roj, depending on the, on the dialect. Another one is the D sound becoming a Z sound. So to know in Persian is don. Don is like the, the, the stem for the word to know. And in Median, it's zun. So to say I know in Persian would be midunem or midanem in median would be zunu. So we see quite a big difference there that makes it harder to understand for people of different regions. Another one, this one also made it into, into Judeo-Persian. So the ST chunk is expressed as an S, a long S sound. So the word for breast, peston, is pesun. Skin, pust, is pus. Rasti becomes rasti. Tired, chaste becomes chaste. The word for bone, and this one I put uh, the Persian lettering also. So the word for bone in Persian is ostochon, related to like osteo in English. So it's an Indo European common word. So ostochon would be expressed as osochu. 
So this starts to change a lot. In Judeo-Median, we have the U sound being expressed as an E sound. So hair in Yazdi, for example, Judeo-Yazdi, hair is Mi instead of the Persian Mu. The word in Persian, in Judeo-Persian for pretty would be Magbul, which actually comes from Hebrew and Arabic. So Magbul, meaning pretty. In Median is Magbil. We have this A sound becoming an E sound. So we have I put 30 examples of that there. So damor, the word for nose, becomes demor. Dava becomes deva. Vaba becomes veba, and so on. So that's more of just like an accent change. So that, that exists in uh, Judeo-Persian as well. That made it, that change made it over. And then in some Median dialects, like Kashi and Esfahani, but also in the non-Median Judeo-Shirazi, this is a really interesting one. The S and Z sounds are expressed as th and th. So it's almost like a list. And a really interesting thing is that the people who speak these dialects don't even really realize that they're doing it. Like they'll say, they'll code switch between Judeo-Shirazi and Persian, and they'll say the same word, but they'll say it with an S or with a, or with a th, depending on which dialect they're speaking. Um, and they don't necessarily notice that they're even saying it differently. So for example, we had that word for bone, osohu, in their in the actual uh, Kashi dialect, that would be osohu. Instead of osohu, it's osohu. But then, if you ask them, well, how do you say that in Persian? They would say osohu. So there's like a there's like a, a thing in the mind that happens to these speakers when they switch to one of their old Jewish dialects, and they they start to do this list. It's really interesting. Now, Yazdi and Kermani, these are both uh, also Judeo-Median dialects, and they're kind of the furthest east, so they have features of their own that are quite different from other ones. So these features include that, that same the sound becoming an R, and they also have penultimate stress. All these other languages have final stress, so the last syllable is stressed. So you'd say osohu, but in Yazdi, you would, it's the second to last. You would say osohu. So... Another example, so in Persian, the word for house, uh, there's a, an old Persian word for house, which is kade. In Judeo Esfahani, as we said, it would be keze or expressed as keze. And in Judeo Yazdi, it would be kere. So kere is quite different from keze or from kade. And that makes it really hard to understand. Yazd, again, Yazd is also in the same province as Esfahan. They're not very far from each other. Um, you could drive from one to the other in a couple hours. But if they're speaking, if the Jews from these towns are speaking the, their languages to each other, it wouldn't work that well. It wouldn't be that easy for them to understand what the other guy's saying. Um, just to get another sense of how, uh, how different these languages can be, here's a list of, we're not going to look at all these, but here's just some vocabulary. And if you take any of these lines and go from left to right, you can see how different they are. So uh, we can look at the word for dog. You have things like esbe, kuve, kuye, kuya, esbo, espo, and keleb. These are all pretty different. Um, if we look down about halfway, the word sneeze, every single one of these is totally different. Akse, oshnije, erchene, peshka, sero, voshe. These are all totally different. And I mean, the, you wouldn't be able to understand somebody who's speaking, you, you know, one of these dialects from a different place. Some of them are a little more similar. The word for cat seems to be relatively uniform, They're kind of in two groups, but the vocabulary is pretty different. And it's not just the vocabulary, it's also the grammar. So here's a conjugation of the word to be. So I am, you are, he is, so on. So we can see how different it is here. So in Persian, it's expressed in suffixes. Am, so hastam, hasti, hast, hastim, hastid, hastam. That's how you do that. In Hamaduni, it's han, he, hu, him, hid, hend. In Esfahani, it's ethun, ethe, ethu, ethim, ethid, ethen. Very, very different. You're not gonna, you know, even a verb as simple as to be is completely different between these languages. Now, what about the Southwestern languages? Are these more similar to each other? Is Shirazi more similar to Persian at least? Well, let's take a look. The sentence is, 
Both of them said, last night we dreamed a bad dream. In Persian, in kind of uh, formal Persian, this is what's translated here. It says, Har Kodomashan Goftan di Shab Chaba Bad Bidein. Or in more colloquial Persian, it would be Har Kudumashun Goftan di Shab Chaba Bad Bidein. Great. These are pretty similar sentences. Now we go up to Shirazi, and suddenly it's super different, even though this is a Southwest language developed in exactly the same place as Persian. So Judeo Shirazi is Har Kodomashu Eshugo di Shnachoa Bad Emudeden. So if you just look at those kind of next to each other, you can kind of track these sentences and see that they're pretty different. You're not going to really understand one if you understand the other. So both Judeo-Median and Judeo-Shirazi, uh, they both preserve characteristics long gone from New Persian, which is about 1,200 years old. Um, these languages preserve things from before that. They preserve things like the ergative construction of past verbs, which is a, this is a kind of a complicated linguistic thing, but uh, I'll just, we'll, I have one example here. So the word, the phrase I ate in Persian is khordam. Khord means eat, and am is a suffix that means I did it. Right? So the way you determine who did the eating is with the suffix. So khordam, but if I'm saying you ate, I would say khordi. So that suffix is what changes the person. In Judeo Yazdi, that same phrase is emcha. Em being the prefix that changes the person, and cha means ate. So I ate is emcha, but he ate is eshcha. So it is now changing with a prefix instead of a suffix. And then in Judeo Esfahani, it's with an infix. So it's that, that M letter right in the middle of the word. So I ate is bemchort, and he ate is beshchort. So this is a, we don't need to get too much deeper into that, but um, this is a feature that's present in other Indo-Iranian languages, other Northwestern languages. This is actually how, one of the ways that we know that the Judeo-Median languages are Northwestern. Um, because it's present in Iranian Kurdish languages. It's also still present in Hindi and Urdu. This is a feature that Persian used to have and lost, but the Jewish languages have preserved over all these years. So that's a really cool thing. These Jewish languages are in some senses, the only languages that are preserving a lot of the old features of Persian that have been lost by the general um, main dialect. Of course, Judeo-Shirazi, even though it's not a Northwestern language, Judeo-Shirazi also preserves that ergative construction just because it, it preserves it from when Persian used to have it. Now, Judeo-Persian and colloquial Judeo-Persian. Let's look at that a little bit. What are some of those features? So literary Judeo-Persian, that written language, which we're gonna look at some examples in a little bit, um, it shows the influence of local dialects. So just like in those median ones we talked about, sometimes on rhymes with un. So you'll see in a couplet that's supposed to rhyme, in the Hebrew letters, one is spelled on and one is spelled un. And if you didn't know that the way those are pronounced, you'd think this guy is really bad at rhyming. Uh, somebody who is just, who doesn't know these dialects might read that poem and say, wait, this is, this is bad. What they don't realize is that's the way it was pronounced. Um, the Hebrew and Aramaic component also varies based on the writer. So there are some writers of Judeo-Persian epic poems who are very, very well versed in Persian, classical Persian poetry, and they don't use that much Hebrew or Aramaic. They use basically classical Persian. And then there are other writers who are either more religious or less educated in Persian poetry or more educated in rabbinical Judaism or whatever it is, or even like the city they're from, who knows? Um, and sometimes they have way more Hebrew in their poetry. So it's still Persian poetry. It's still largely classical Persian, but it will have much more Hebrew in it. So that just really depends on the writer. Now, what about spoken Judeo-Persian? So this is, uh, this is a little different. So spoken Judeo-Persian, this was, Sarachadi specifically was developed in Tehran only in the last couple hundred years when people from all these other cities moved to the, the same city. They all moved to the same neighborhood in Tehran. And their common language was Persian, right? Somebody from Hamadan didn't speak the same language as someone from Shiraz. And so they moved to Tehran and 
their common language was Persian. So they all started speaking colloquial Tehrani Persian, not even formal, just colloquial Tehrani Persian, but it was affected by all their own languages that they brought with them. So it has some features from all of these other dialects we've talked about. So it's also not necessarily uniform among speakers, depending on where your ancestors are from, your Judeo-Persian might be a little different from someone else's, but it has this distinct musicality that's often mocked in jokes um, among general Persian society, among non-Jewish society, they make a lot of jokes about Jews and the ways that they talk, the musical way that, that our dialects are. Um, and it has a lot of those phonological changes that we mentioned from, uh, from the Judeo-Median languages and from Shirazi and things like that that made it into this Jewish dialect of Persian that is still spoken today by some people. Now, in addition to all of that, in case you were not confused enough, there's also Lutarai, the secret language, the secret jargon of Iranian Jews. So what is that? How is that different from all these other languages we're talking about? So the Jews working in the bazaar didn't necessarily want, uh, well, bazaar, or if you're from Kashan, the vajar, that's how you say bazaar in Judeo-Kashani, because the Z becomes a J, so vajar. So in the bazaar, they would, they didn't want these non-Jews who were around to understand what they were saying. So they needed a secret language, even though they already had their own Judeo-Median languages that they could speak, they still needed even, an even more secret language, which tells you a lot about the kind of social history of the Jews in Iran. So they invented this language that's basically Persian or Median grammar, but with a Hebrew and Aramaic vocabulary. So think about if you were speaking English with an English grammar, but replacing like most of the nouns and verbs with Hebrew ones. So here's an example. The sentence says, I want to go to the street. I shall go and return. So in Median, in one of the Judeo-Median languages, and I think this is Judeo-Gopaigani, it would be, Mongun beshon chiavon shon varagandon. This is a classic uh, Northwest Iranian sentence. Mon is me. That's a that's a Persian word or a you know Iranian word. Gun beshon, I will go and come and onto the street chiavon. Shon uh, varagandon, I will go and come back. Now, if we look at that in Lutra'i, which is the second line, it's completely different. It's anibayun bezon. Chiaban, shon vaezon. So ani, that's from Hebrew. Ani is I in Hebrew. Bayun is, um, that un is a median construct. That's a median suffix. But the bay is from the Aramaic word for want, related to um, ahava, the, that have becomes bayun in, in Aramaic. Then you get bezon. The b and the on are median prefix and suffix, but the ez is Aramaic. Ez is the Aramaic uh, root for going, and so on. And then chiabon is a Persian word, and then shon vaezon is another mix of Median and Aramaic. So if you're an Aramaic speaker, this might be actually easier to understand, uh, but you would still need to know the Median grammar, which is why this is such a good secret language. Another example we can look at is this curse at the bottom, and this language is Actually, all of these languages are very good for uh, cursing your enemies. Um, so the sentence is Datasha Surefkon. It's like, may his religion burn. So this is uh, something you would say about someone. The word dot comes from Hebrew. It's the word for religion, even though actually way back it's from Persian, but uh, it's the Hebrew word for religion. Then that ash is the third person possessive from Persian. A is the object marker from Persian, again, or it's actually a modification of that. Suref, again, is from Hebrew. It means burning. And kon is the Persian word do. So it's creating a compound verb now. Suref kon is do the burning, but the burning is used in Hebrew. So again, this very interesting mix. So if you want to look at like what that would be in English, it would be like instead of saying may his religion burn. It's like if you said, may his dot soref. So if you're not a, if you're not Jewish or you don't speak Hebrew, you're not gonna, and you live in America, you're not gonna understand what dot, you're not gonna understand what may his dot soref means, right? It's like a weird mix of languages and grammars. So that's, you know, on top of all of these languages we're learning about, 
um, there's even this other secret language. So pretty mind blowing. Now, what's some of the language contact that these languages had? Were they influenced by other languages? The main influence is standard Persian. All of these languages lived in small Jewish neighborhoods within major Persian cities throughout Iran. All these cities were speaking Persian. The non-Jewish communities spoke Persian. And so these languages, even though they split off from Persian so long ago, have continued to be influenced by Persian for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So they've developed parallel to Persian. And so we do see a lot of similarities in them, even though uh, the, the split was a long time ago. Younger speakers, and younger speakers is a relative term because most of these speakers of these languages are quite old, um, but younger speakers use more Persian words, or if they live in Israel, more Hebrew words. When they can't remember the original Median word, they'll use, you know, a word from a language they do speak. Judeo Hamadani has some Turkish loan words because they're near some Turkish speaking areas, and Judeo Yazdi has some similarities to the Zoroastrian dialect of Yazd. But again, this is all new, a new subject. So nobody's done real research on what those similarities are. But basically, these languages are mainly influenced by standard Persian and Arabic, just because Persian is influenced by Arabic and so on. But really, they don't have a lot of contact with other languages. It's not like Judeo-Spanish that we talked about that has major Ottoman Turkish contact. That didn't really happen because these languages didn't move from one place to another. They just stayed kind of in these Jewish neighborhoods for many, many, many years. Now, the Hebrew and Aramaic component of these is really interesting. We can see some of the Hebrew and Aramaic words that are used in these languages. So, baracha, that's a classic Hebrew word for blessing. This is used in most of the Jewish dialects of Iran, Jewish languages of Iran. So, baracha shodan, that's a phrase that means um, to be blessed, but that's used not literally as to be blessed, it means to when you finish something. So in Persian Jewish culture, if something finishes, if you finish the food on the table, um, sort of out of superstition, you don't say that we ran out of food, you say that the food has been blessed. But you use the word beracha. So if you use this phrase beracha shodan with a Persian Muslim, they won't know what you're saying, right? That's a Hebrew word. Another one, it's also used as a numerative. So chan beracha means how many blessings. You don't ever say how many people are we or how many children does he have. You would say how many blessings. So it's just another one. And that's a specifically Jewish thing. Avun is a classic uh, Hebrew word, means sin. So in Persian and Median dialects, we get uh, avun kar, which means avun is sin and then kar means doer. So a doer of sins. You have the phrase awuna bela. Awun is that Hebrew word for sin. Bela is from the Persian word bela, which means like calamity in Persian. So stick them together, stick the Hebrew and Persian together, and you get awuna bela, which means like, oh, woe is me. Then you have words for non Jews, goyim, which is non Jew, and torer, which means oppressor in Hebrew. And then you get these in all of these languages. You get guim. So that O to U shift, so Guim is non-Jew. Surer is a word for like an enemy, not necessarily non-Jew, but it's like any enemy, any oppressor is called a Surer, comes from Surer in Hebrew. There's a Hebrew and Aramaic words, Knesset and Knishta, which mean assembly or synagogue. So in Persian, you get Kenisa, or in Median, Kenisa, or if you're Yazdi, Kenisa, because they have that penultimate stress. An interesting one is Meshumad. Meshumad is Hebrew for a Jew who converted to another religion. But in Esfahani, that is used as Meshimeth, which means a naughty boy. So a, a kid who's misbehaving, you call him Meshimeth, which means literally it means a Jew who converted to another religion, but it means like you're being a rascal. And then Shabbat. Shabbat's, you know, we all know what Shabbat is. In all these languages, you get Shabbat. That's Saturday. Yek Shabbat is Sunday. Do Shabbat, Monday. If I were to tell my Persian Muslim friends that I'll see them on Yek Shabbat, they wouldn't know what I'm saying. I'd have to say Yek Shabbat, which is the Persian word. So we have kind of these distinct things in our own languages. Some other cool things. So just phrases we have. Be'emet HaTura. That means by the truth of the Torah. Another mix of Hebrew and Persian. Um, 
any Persian speakers can try to figure out what this one means. It's the Hag Abraham which means by the merit of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, if the, if a Muslim was crying out, they would probably not be naming the Jewish patriarchs. They would probably name someone from Muslim history. The word for face, so the word for face in Persian is chehre. That's a formal word. Nobody really uses that colloquially. Colloquially, people will say surat, which is from Arabic. But Jews will often use the old Persian word dim, dim uh, related to uh, dome in Hebrew and Aramaic, so to resemble, dim means face. Or they'll also use the word punim or panim, depending on which town you're from. So uh, I love that one because that kind of, a lot of people are familiar with the word punim in Yiddish, or like somebody has a sheina punim, right? They have a pretty face. So in Farsi or in, in Judeo-Persian, you would say some, you say punimish chanime, which means his, her face is beautiful. There are compound verbs. So you take a Hebrew word and put it onto a Persian verb <clears throat> to get a new meaning. So shatar is the Hebrew word for contract. Neveshten is the Persian word for writing. Shatar neveshten, you put them together. That means signing the ketubah. Mila kadan, that's another one. Mila is circumcision. Kadan is doing. So a brit mila in Persian is called milakunun, which means the, the doing of the circumcision. Another one, ta'anit gereftan. Ta'anit is Hebrew word for fasting. Gereftan is the Persian word for keeping or right getting. So ta'anit gereftan means keeping a fast. So when I was a kid, I would ask, I remember asking my Muslim Persian friend if on Ramadan, if they do ta'anit, if they ta'anit gereftan. And he had no idea what I was talking about. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I learned that ta'anit is a Hebrew word and he wouldn't know that word. They have a different word that they use. There are also bits of Lutarai, that secret language, in the Tehran Jewish dialects. So you get things like Lubemeshtan or Lashun Bara, both of which mean basically like stop talking. Lashun is from the Hebrew Lashon, tongue or language. And you also get Persian euphemisms that make it into these Jewish dialects. So things like Durajun, which comes from the Persian, Persian Dur as Dun. May it be far from your soul, or dura genabi, or if you're Esfahani, that u becomes e, so it's dira jun and dira genabi, and these are words that are used as euphemisms. So things like salt, uh, salt is considered to be like kind of evil eye related. So sometimes instead of saying pass the salt, you'll say can you pass the dura genabi, meaning may it be far from you. Some dialects, they won't mention the names of sharp items. Like you, won't, you wouldn't say knife, you would say, may it be far from you when you refer to a knife. These are very Jewish, uh, Jewish things. Some of them are not only for the Jews. Uh, the, that last one, non-Jews will also use those in very colloquial Persian. But the Jews kind of, the Jewish dialects take it further um, and they incorporate that Hebrew thing too. Now, writing systems. How are these languages written? How are they preserved? How, who's been writing these languages down for the last 2,000 years? So the answer generally is that for Judeo-Median languages, for the Jewish-Persian dialects, for Lutarai, and also for the Iranian dialects of Neo-Aramaic, the answer is nobody. Nobody has ever really written these languages. These are basically spoken languages. So we don't have really any written versions of these. There are some attempts, um, like this on the right, attempts to write these languages in Latin script. There are a couple attempts to write them in Perso-Arabic script, um, but these are very, very recent. Historically, we don't have this at all. Somebody from Esfahan in the 1500s, when they wrote anything, they wrote it in Persian. They wrote letters in Persian to each other. And if they wrote them in Judeo-Median languages, we don't have those letters. We don't have any examples. There's really one document from the Cairo Geniza, it's around a thousand years old, that's in an unknown Judeo-Median language written in Hebrew characters. It's, a, it's like a magical thing. It tells you how to solve your different ailments. Um, that's basically it. We don't really have any other examples of Judeo-Median historically written. So that's another reason it's really important to be recording these languages and 
uh, writing them down now, now that we know they exist and we should be writing them um, because we don't have a lot of historical evidence of them existing. Judeo-Persian, on the other hand, has a huge, huge literature that goes way back um, to the first known examples of written New Persian. New Persian was actually written in Hebrew characters by Jews before it was ever written in Arabic characters. Uh, this is one of those examples on the left. That's the Dandan Uyilid letter found in Western China. It's around 1,200 years old, I think. Um, I, can read, <clears throat> I can read this as a Persian speaker and pretty much understand it since it's Persian. It's actually closer to, like, it's easier to understand than, like, listening to Esfahani, which is a crazy, it's just crazy. Um, some manuscripts that you read reflect classical standard Persian. Others show influence of local dialects. So written when they're written by Jews, they often show these like dialectical features too. So for example, in 1662, there's Kataba Anusi by Babai ben Lotf. It's about the persecutions of Jews in the 1600s. Um, and it was written in Judeo-Persian. It's a massive epic poem. The whole thing's written in classical Judeo-Persian, but it has a lot of low words in it and linguistic, fe linguistic features from Judeo-Kashani because he himself was from Kashan. It's, that's really cool. That's kind of maybe the closest thing we have to written Judeo-Median, even though it's not in Judeo-Median, it's written in Judeo-Persian, but it is, it has some words here and there that are from Median and it, it has this local flavor. So if a non-Jew were to read this book, they would vastly, they would understand the whole thing pretty much. And there would be some words here and there that they'd go, I don't know what that is. I don't know what this guy's saying. This is weird. Um, it would just have some weird vocabulary in it, but largely they would understand it. There are some 19th century manuscripts um, that I've found that have, uh, that are from Tehran, and they have some features of Sayachali, that Jewish Persian dialect, that spoken Jewish Persian dialect, but they're still overwhelmingly standard classical Persian. People didn't write the way that they spoke. So I, I mentioned this to my parents yesterday, and they were telling me, like, yeah, it would be weird for us to write the way that we speak. When we write, we write in formal Persian. It's a completely, it's like a different language than colloquial spoken Persian. Um, so even if we're not even talking about the median languages not being written, we're just talking about Jewish Persian dialects being written, even those aren't really written, they're generally standard Persian. So here's some examples of Judeo-Persian, generally written in Hebrew letters. In the top, you have uh, a couplet from Shahin, uh, who was from Shiraz about 700 years ago. And even though he was from Shiraz, he wasn't writing in Judeo-Shirazi. He was writing in standard classical Persian. The top left, we have Emrani. He was from Esfahan, but he wasn't writing in Judeo-Esfahani. He was writing in classical standard Persian with some Hebrew loan words. On the right, we have uh, a printed version of uh, a song from Purim. This is a Purim song in Judeo-Persian. This is printed, I found this in a book in Israel like two months ago. So this is like still being printed in some places. So that's pretty cool. In the middle, we have uh, that same Kashi one from Babai ben Mutch. So it's written in Persian, but this is a list of some of the Hebrew words that he uses, the Hebrew loan words that he uses in his book. And then on the bottom left, it's kind of small there, but we have... Um, this is from a Haggadah that was found in Kaifeng in China. So this is a community that's far removed from Persia, but even all the way in China, the directions in between the Hebrew parts, the directions are written in Judeo-Persian. So this is a huge, huge literary language that was used through most of Asia. Wherever Jews were traveling along the Silk Road or all the way down in India, they were writing in Judeo-Persian, but that's not necessarily what they were speaking. Writing in Judeo-Persian continued even into the 18 and 1900s, so the early 1900s. We have some examples of published kind of magazines that were published for the Jewish community in Judeo-Persian. So on the left, you have Tuki Veturki, which is a, this is an essay about Christopher Columbus that was written in the early 1900s in a newspaper called Hagetula. And if you're a Hebrew speaker, you can try to read that and it won't make any sense to you because it's Persian. It's a Persian language. Um, really, it's quite standard, normal Persian, but it's written in Hebrew letters. On the right, that's actually, that's me and my grandfather in that picture. Um, I found this page in my grandfather's stuff, and I think he has a lot more of these. 
And it's from Yade Eliyahu, another publication from the early 1900s um, that is uh, written in Judeo-Persian. And then it also has a rubric for how to read Judeo-Persian if you only know uh, Perso-Arabic script. So this is from a time when people were, were no longer learning to write in Judeo-Persian and were starting to write in that Perso-Arabic script. And not long after this, people stopped writing in that. So I have some letters from my grandfather that he would write in Judeo-Persian by hand, but my parents' generation no longer would write in Judeo-Persian. They would write in regular Persian. And like I came back and showed them stuff in Judeo-Persian. And together we've kind of learned how to read and write Judeo-Persian in these Hebrew letters, just because it's not a tradition that continued. Things started to change in the 20th century and the 1900s as uh, Allianz schools came from France and tried to modernize the Jewish community. Um, these Judeo-Median languages stopped being spoken as much as people became more educated. They would speak standard Persian. They would write in standard Persian. They would no longer be writing in Judeo-Persian and speaking Judeo-Median. So these languages declined heavily in the last hundred or so years. Which brings us to sociolinguistic variation. Um, that's a picture of the Tehran ghetto in the 1800s. So this is where all these languages were mixing and, you know. Sociolinguistic variation is actually hard to quantify for this field because these dialects are almost exclusively spoken by elderly individuals. It's hard to say that like there are differences between the way men and women talk or older people or younger people talk when so few people speak these languages. Uh, also, most people that speak these languages well are people who have both parents from the same city or even their own spouses from the same city, because then they can practice these languages. If somebody from Kerman marries somebody from Nahavend, they probably won't speak these languages or teach them to their kids because their common language becomes Persian. So as these cities and communities have all mixed together, uh, proficiency has dropped. Luturai, the secret language, is virtually extinct. I don't know anybody who like actually speaks that. Um, there are some words and phrases that are surviving through other dialects, like in Tehran, through Sarachali, but it was mostly known among men who worked in the bazaar. So the way that I know some of my Luturai phrases is through my grandmother. My grandmother was not a man who worked in the bazaar, but her husband was and her father was. Um, that's the bust of her father right there. Uh, so she learned those phrases from her dad and from her husband, and then she remembers some of them. And so I learned from her, but, you know, if my grandfather was alive, he would probably be able to tell me much, much more. Um, all of these dialects are seen as lower class, whether they're Median, whether they're Shirazi, whether they're Persian, these Jewish dialects are all seen as lower class. They're seen as like not very, um, pleasant. And so people who have higher status, people who are more educated, generally opt to speak Persian. They don't speak these languages among themselves. And, you know, sometimes they won't even admit that they speak the language. You have to kind of pull it out of them uh, because it looks bad for them if they're seen speaking this kind of lower class language. And the people who speak these languages better are generally the ones who didn't become educated, didn't move to Tehran and learn standard Persian as well. Um, some dialects are better preserved in Israel because those people left Iran in the 50s from the small town they were already in, and they went straight to Israel, and so they didn't really get this Persian standard education they left when they were young. So recently I was in Israel, and I met this older man and who was Persian, and I started speaking to him in Persian, and he told me he doesn't speak Persian. But then I started speaking to him in Judeo-Yazdi, and he could speak Judeo-Yazdi. So that's a really rare <clears throat> it's really rare for somebody to speak not that standard language, but they speak their Jewish dialectical language. So uh, that's that's pretty rare and obviously dying out because um, I don't know many people under the age of 70 who speak any of these languages. These languages are more likely to be used in daily situations, food, greetings, curses, lots of curses, uh, household, religion. They're not really used in education, intellectual discussion, or like professional things, unless your profession is as a merchant in the bazaar. Sometimes these languages are used for in-group socialization. So at a Persian party, if there are a group of Burujaridi speakers, usually like two or three siblings, because, you know, it's pretty rare, but you might see them speaking to each other over there in their language, but generally they'll speak Persian so that everyone understands and want to be inclusive. And so 
it's increasingly rare to even hear these languages. I never really heard any of these languages until I started seeking them out and like going up and asking people, where are your parents from? Do you speak that language? And then they will come out with the language. So finally, contemporary status. How many people speak these languages? Again, this is a super new field really, and we don't, there isn't much data about it. So we don't know how many people speak these languages. There are some dialects who have zero speakers, they're extinct. There are some dialects that are moribund, that are on the verge of extinction, maybe have dozens of speakers, maybe even just a handful of speakers. And if we consider Persian, or at least the Jewish dialects of Persian, any slightly Jewish dialect of Persian, if we consider that, then there might be hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people who speak them, but it's not really being passed on through the generations. More and more, our Persian is not a Jewish Persian, and it's just standard Persian. And so these languages really are dying. Speakers of distinctly Jewish dialects are generally very old. So my grandmother speaks um, a Jewish dialect of Tehrani Persian, which isn't even that different from standard Persian, and she's 92. So these are definitely disappearing. If they're spoken at all, they're spoken in the United States, Israel, and Iran. But again, we don't really know how many. There are places in Israel, there are some shuks that you can go to, and every store owner is from Esfahan. And if you get them going, they'll all start speaking Esfahani to each other. But it again, their kids don't speak it. So these are on their way out. Um, as for post-vernacular activity, People doing the, you know, people who didn't grow up speaking these languages now making new content in these languages. There's a very little amount. There are some new recordings by Jewish Language Project, um, Galit and Alon and Adi, who are in that video at the beginning. They're making some new songs in some of these languages, and that's that's cool, but it's generally still very, very limited. It's a very small amount that's happening. There is a comedy group in Israel that does uh, skits and jokes in Esfahani which are pretty funny, um, but these are some videos from YouTube. I don't know how old they are. They look to be a little bit old, so I don't even know if they're still doing this. It's, it's hard to know. Um, if you really seek it out, you might find some things here and there, but again, it's, not, it's nothing like you see with the post-vernacular activity of Yiddish or Ladino, Judeo-Spanish, um, nothing like that. Of course, that's, that's the dream. That's, that's what I hope for. So, in conclusion, it's basically, it's too late to revive these languages. They're barely even known among the Persian Jewish community. People in our own community don't know that these are languages of their own or that their own grandparents probably spoke these languages. But this post-vernacular activity is still possible. So the question I ask is, who will write the first children's book in Judeo-Yazdi? Who will record new songs in Judeo-Shirazi? Who will transcribe and translate the huge amount of Judeo-Persian texts that we have sitting there in libraries, scanned online that are just sitting there waiting to be put out into the world. They have so much amazing content in them. Who will make a systematic grammar of all of these dialects with recordings so that later generations can continue to learn them? In some cases, the answer is, that's what the Jewish Language Project is doing. That's what different groups are doing. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, there are people who are doing this, but there can always be more. Um, my dream is really to have, you know, a level of interest the same way that Yiddish and Judeo-Spanish have, that this becomes a, a part of our culture, a part of the younger generation of trying to connect with these parts of our culture and these languages um, that tell us so much about who we were and, uh, and you know, who we could continue to be. So thank you for listening. And